Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session of our CISSP. Um, during this session, um, I'd like to uh, some of you asked to uh, also see me, uh, so I'm, I'm uh, operating the video here, but I will soon drop this one and uh, move to uh, the presentation itself. So um, uh, regarding the last session, some of you asked me uh, if that session will be available for all, then yes, it will be available. Unfortunately, uh, that session was not uh, recorded properly, so I will have to redo it again uh, and record it. Um, so that'll be outside the sessions that we booked, that we scheduled. Um, and I will uh, record that and put it on, on YouTube for your availability, uh, for your uh, um, usage uh, later on. So um, without further ado, let's continue from the place uh, that uh, we stopped last time. Uh, and uh, hoping to see more people joining this session. I know it was kind of the last minute uh, call. Um, people didn't know if, if this session will take place or not, but it is taking place, especially now when, when we're all home and in quarantine, self-quarantine as they call it. Um, so uh, let me turn off the camera and I'll bring up the presentation and we will start the session um, shortly. Uh, so, <clears throat> okay. Let me put this one up and um, share my screen. And here we are. This is this is where we stopped last time. So last session um, we talked about the um, security engineering. We started domain three of the CISSP and we stopped at this slide, the codes versus ciphers. And codes are a system of symbols, as we can see in the pictures and the ciphers are hidden meaning uh, always meant to hide the true meaning of the message and we i, I put i put uh, this picture uh, from a disney movie saying uh, in every disney movie we can actually see this mickey mouse uh face with the uh, kind of logo of um uh, disney movies uh, if you may. So look look up for it for this uh, uh, sign in, in Disney movies, uh, future Disney movies or any movie you go back to and, and actually uh, watch that these days. So um, next one, we continue with uh, the background about encryption and we take a deeper dive into uh, encryption systems and technology, if you may. So we talked about the concept of encryption and we talked about the way encryption works uh, in the eyes of the protector. Um, <clears throat> the concept itself, I hope it's clear, but uh, what we're going to do as of this this one now, uh, we're going to speak a bit more technicalities about encryption, hoping to uh, conclude uh, this chapter, chapter uh, six, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, um, to complete this chapter today, and then next week we're going to do the uh, next chapter for uh, digital signatures and everything else that comes uh, after we understand and complete this uh, part of encryption. So um, next one, uh, after we talk about codes and ciphers. There is this another uh, uh, one more term that we need to understand. Um, it's called one time pad. And I know you, some of you are connecting it to a uh, one time password and you write about this. It's one time use of a key of some sort of a key or some sort of a, uh, an identifier that I can use once and never reuse again. So for uh, encryption, uh, think of it this way. I have a key that works once and never will work again. This provides additional uh, protection on my encryption process. Um, it's random, uh, uh, it's never used again, and we need to make sure that those pads that we use, pads for the one-time uh, uh, use, they are secure, they're, they're relatively secure. So um, this was uh, uh, taken from, from uh, the concept of one-time use of uh, a password from the Vietnam War, uh, where pilots use that to decipher codes uh, that were sent to them. But this is a, a long story, a different story, not related to the CISSP, so uh, it will not be in your exam. Um, 
the zero knowledge proof is something uh, interesting because um, as as you look at this picture, there's there's a whole um, uh, there's a whole story behind it. And uh, if you look it up in on, on uh, Wikipedia, you can find uh, the uh, zero knowledge. Uh, 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 story about uh, Victor and uh, let me let me recall the Peggy and Victor. Uh, those two, <clears throat> Peggy and Victor, are kind of playing a game here, uh, if you may, uh, and they are kind of challenging each other. Basically, the zero knowledge proof uh, is to show that um, the recipients or the the receiver of the information of the message, the encrypted message, is actually the one that we want to speak to, is actually the right person. It's their uh, burden of proof, if you may, burden of proof to us to show that, yes, it is me. Um, in this case, you can, you can read about it in Wikipedia, how uh, um, uh, Peggy goes to A and she asks uh, Victor to go the, the same direction and open the door, and he opens the door from the side, the, 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 the right side, because he knows the code for that door. If he wouldn't know the code, then it proved that it's not Victor, and so on and so forth. I will not uh, um, give you the, the, the hard time of the story about this, but the zero knowledge proof means that we're not really sharing any information. We're basically challenging the identity of the recipient, okay? This is zero knowledge proof. No real data is transferred between A and B, between uh, Peggy and Victor, between Alice and Bob, whoever it is in your CISSP question. Now, um, another term is split knowledge. Split knowledge comes from the concept of no one individual should hold all the information. No one individual can hold the, the, the full key for the encryption. Hence, and therefore, uh, we need to have at least two identities or, or two individuals that will help um, uh, combine the two parts of the key of whatever secret that we hold, okay? The key is the concept of a secret that we hold. Uh, two together uh, combined will help us uh, uh, decipher the code or use the right key for that matter. So again, the split knowledge <clears throat> means that the information, sensitive information, the, the, the secret information, okay, is divided among multiple users in order for them to protect the key, okay? Sometimes, uh, for example, in, in, in the PCI DSS uh, uh, standard, you will find the term dual key or dual control, and it refers to the same thing, um, basically an encryption, but in many different areas uh, that we can use as well. Uh, so again, dual key, um, split knowledge, and, and th those are basically the same. Next one, <clears throat> we're going to start touching the um, types of crypto systems. Types of crypto systems kind of divided to uh, mainly two different areas. The crypto systems are either symmetric or asymmetric. And we will speak about each one of them separately. Um, however, when we want to uh, strengthen the uh, um, crypto system that we use, we sometimes use sometimes we use hash hash functions, um, and and we we need to remember this uh, three terms and the difference between them. Um, the different the main difference between uh, uh, symmetric and asymmetric uh, is the speed, is the way we protect the keys, is the way we issue the keys, and uh, basically the way we think about the cost and benefit of what it is that we're trying to do. Um, let me go to our conversation area and see if we have any questions or uh, asks uh, of any sort. Uh, no, I don't see anything uh, there. So um, let's um, continue with the presentation. Sorry about that. Had to check and give you guys time to um, actually join the conversation, join the uh, the online bootcamp. Um, so again, the symmetric uses different concept of keys 
then the asymmetric, one of them is faster, one of them is slower, one of them is more secure, one of them is less secure. It depends on what you want to achieve, depends on the business flow that you're trying to support. Okay, but remember, crypto systems always support the two principles, confidentiality and integrity, and not more than that. The hash will help us strengthen the security of the crypto system, and we'll see that in, in a moment. <clears throat> the symmetric um, uh, key uh, is basically a shared key. Okay, so we use one key in symmetric key between A and B. Okay, we always talk about two parties, the A and B. They want to transfer information. They want to share information. That's why they need the encryption. Okay, they need the encryption to share the information securely. So there is one key between the two, one shared key between the two, while with the asymmetric crypto system, there's always a pair of keys. So there is a private key and a public key to each party, each side. A has its own uh, uh, private and public key and B has its own public and private keys. And that uh, creates a different concept of or a different method of encryption. When, uh, uh, when we want to achieve, for example, um, faster encryption, we will probably use symmetric crypto, crypto system because we don't need to exchange too many keys here. We don't have the uh, 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 integrity check of the key. We don't need to verify the sender that it is a sender. We kind of rely on the identities and we rely on the circle of encryption uh, with the symmetric crypto system. That's why it's much, much faster. And uh, the uh, uh, asymmetric crypto system, while it's a bit slower than the symmetric, achieves more than that because we can verify the keys, because we can do a lot more in terms of integrity checks, we can achieve the non-repudiation, we can do, achieve the authentic, authenticity, authentication, and so on and so forth. So we will see that later on but basically what I would like you to do uh, if you're not if you're not uh, uh, um, uh, that certain that you actually understand the difference between the four areas I would like to recommend to go back to that session again it will be recorded again uh, by me in the, in the next day or two uh, and uploaded but go back to session before this one and uh, um, revisit the uh, confidentiality, integrity, non-repudiation, and authentication uh, achieved by the control called cryptography. <clears throat> now let's look at the hush functions, hush in general. Hush function is basically a one uh, one way encryption. That's what we call it. We call it one way encryption, even though hush is not encryption. Okay, hush is there to strengthen the uh, uh, the the encryption process of a, a, a crypto system? We will see this in in a moment. But uh, bear in mind that that when we use hash function, we don't um, hide the data. Okay, and also we have no key. We just have the function. We just have the the mathematical process of uh, uh, the, the plain text going through the hash function and then we get the message digest, okay? We get the message digest. We don't get the cipher text. We get that part. We then can encrypt the message digest and hence, you know, we, we strengthen the, the, uh, the encryption process. But okay, go, going back to uh, uh, the hash function itself, hash function again has no key and we use different mathematical functions. You can see some of them here, MD5, MD4, uh, SHA1, 2, and, and 256. Um, it's also called one-way encryption, but it is not an encryption process, okay? It's called hash for a reason. Uh, this will help us do message integrity, and we will speak about this uh, in, in a moment. Uh, the hash, hash function and message digest, as, as mentioned before, uh, we put in the hash function, the plain text. And when we put in the plain text, what we get on the other side, after all the mathematical uh, um, functions that we run, this message, this uh, 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 plain text, we get the message digest. Something that looks like a message, but it's not really a message. You can look it up online and uh, see how a message digest 
looks like. It's kind of one way. There is no way for you to go back, but there is a way for others to hack that, to break that uh, uh, pattern between the message digest and the plain text. And the way it's done is by a comparison of certain keywords or certain uh, um, uh, words inside or, or terms inside a message inside the plain text that some of us will probably use. For example, if you take uh, the uh, any message that uh, you can write write it up and, and uh, uh, look uh, look up for the keywords. For example, any any English message will probably include the word it, I T, it or is or or something that is. Uh, uh, for example, numbers uh, when you write them in in letters one, two, three. Those are common words that can that one can compare their message digest and using the hush function, for example, if you use MD5 and you have the outcome, you have the message digest of the word one, O-N-E, you can compare that to other uh, message digests in, in, in uh, uh, you, you, when they use the MD5. And then with the comparison of the two, you can probably look for the pattern or look for some of the areas uh, in, in that message, that, that plain text message. When this is done, um, the, uh, what, what we call that one is the birthday attack. And it applies when uh, someone is comparing the uh, message digest with known uh, message or, or word digest, let's call it this way. They find two strings that are the same and then they, by comparing them they get to the original message. So the birthday attack comes from the idea that if you put 31, 32 or 33 people together in a room and you go one by one, I don't remember the exact number, but it's kind of statistical model that you go one by one and you compare the birthdays uh, day in a month, you will end up having at least two people in, in one room uh, that have the birthday in the same day in the same month, not necessarily the same year, but the same day, the same month, 30 something people. And this is the concept behind the birthday attack. The more you have, the more directories you have, the more information about message digests you have, and you can download that from the internet. You can, you are in a better position to compare parts of that captured message. Let's say you captured message just of some some sort of an encrypted message, and you can compare that to your directories, to your uh, um, uh, uh, the, the the lists of of message digests that you have uh, downloaded from the internet. So uh, next one is you know when we say hash. It sounds like it's all protected, and it's one way and uh, um, uh, one way uh, encryption. Let's call it this way, quote unquote. It sounds very uh, protected. It is in some way, but it is not in the same token. It is not because um, what we have with the hash function is that the more we use it, the more vulnerable it is. The the more popular that hush function is with organizations. Let's say all the banks in the world use MD5. So every transaction, probably every transaction that is encrypted, use the hush function, uh, the MD5 hash function along the way. If we know that about bank transactions, for example, just giving an example, uh, but if we know that, then it's easier for us to target that repetition. And we said that last, the last session, we said repetition is the enemy of encryption because if you have repetition, you have low entropy, and that means that you keep repeating the pattern. You create a pattern and you make it easier for your attackers to uh, break your encryption. So what can we do about this? What we do about this is what we, what we call salted hash uh, when we have uh, for example, and I'm pointing on the presentation here, uh, we have the input of the plain text. Uh, when it's not salted, we will always get the same hash uh, from uh, uh, that input, from that, that word that we use. 
Uh, for example, a password. Password that instead of the word, the letter O uses the number zero. Okay, that's the same input all the time. So if we use the same hash function, we will always get the same output, the same message digest, which is this one right here. But so basically, we understand that that the problem is the repetition. Okay, so we want to avoid that repetition. So we use random salt, what we call salt, quote unquote, random uh, um, value or string here added to that input, added that to that plain text. And then the message I just did, the outcome is now constantly different. So we avoid the repetition process, okay? So we're using that salt, which is a random string, we avoid repetition or we, we try to avoid repetition, okay? Um, so this one is for the uh, hash functions. Uh, now we talk about the triple des as a, a symmetric, uh, not asymmetric, but symmetric uh, crypto system. Is, and here we use uh, and what you can find on your book, we, we use the 57-bit uh, 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 key and we use that one uh, to uh, encrypt uh, uh, three times or, or three uh, um, uh, in, in three cycles the same message. So we use the uh, message uh, encryption with the first key and then we decrypt it with the second key and then encrypt it again with the third key. That's called triple DES. We constantly go through the DES function of encryption and we get better security this way. Um, and it's uh, it, it, we came to that after understanding that the DES function was not as strong as we thought it is. And then the double DES was not, a, was not strong uh, enough again, and then uh, somewhere uh, in the uh, late 90s, beginning of 2000, uh, we moved to triple S, which is considered uh, secure today, uh, but uh, not as secure as AES, which we will see uh, in, in a second. So the triple S uh, encrypts the message with three iterations of this. Three iterations, that means that it's not the same, uh, uh, it's not the same output, it's exponentially uh, stronger when, as we use the this function and again, and again, again. So three keys, uh, three iterations of this. Uh, AES advanced encryption standard, which is considered the, uh, um, the most common today. Uh, it is also recognized by the US government as the standard for uh, um, symmetric uh, encryption and we use for that one we use keys uh, length the length of, of keys of 128 192 and 256 bits and uh, for the AES we use fixed block size and if you don't remember the block size go back to the previous session and look for the uh, uh, the, the example that I give there for the block size and how it looks in, in, in visualize that for um, uh, technical and crypto, uh, crypto systems. Um, <clears throat> the idea is another uh, 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 symmetric crypto system, and this one is kind of um, a better version of the, of the DES. It uses 128-bit uh, keys and 64-bit plaintext blocks. So uh, if the DES used the 57-bit keys, then the, the block, sorry, then this one uses 64-bit plaintext, uh, which help us uh, um, uh, protect, better protect it um, uh, against uh, uh, the, the, uh, breaking the, uh, the cipher itself. Um, the Blowfish and Two Fish, thanks to Bruce Schneier for these two, uh, are two versions of um, relatively uh, strong encryptions, uh, encryption uh, uh, crypto systems. And again, these two are uh, symmetric crypto systems. These are all symmetric crypto systems. 
And um, uh, thanks to Bruce Nair, uh, we started using the Blowfish, which is considered very uh, strong uh, encryption. And uh, Mr. Schneier said that uh, came up to to uh, with this uh, Blowfish uh, crypto system and said that it will be free and open to everyone to for everyone to use and improve that uh, by sharing that knowledge. Knowledge is something you want to share. And again, this is something we, we truly believe in. Uh, later on the years, uh, Mr. Schneier presented the two fish saying there are some flaws in the Blowfish, even though uh, we all agree that it is strong and nothing uh, major uh, uh, kind of uh, drew the attention to that area, but he brought the two fish as a better version of that one of the blowfish. Uh, again, what you need to remember to your, for your CISSP exam is the uh, key and block size. This is something that you want to memorize. Uh, okay, the, those questions that you want to memorize and not necessarily understand. The RC5 is another um, symmetric uh, uh, crypto system. And for that one, the block sizes uh, are 3264 or 128 bits. And the key can range from 0 to 2048. Uh, relatively strong, uh, different uses. Um, and again, you can read about it uh, in, in your book. Um, different uses and I highly recommend on going to the book and um, uh, following up on the uh, RC5 and uh, RC6 as well. Um, <clears throat> asymmetric crypto system uh, um, in general and I would like to, to spend the, the couple of minutes with you on just understanding the concept of uh, private keys and public keys. And this is really important. This slide and the next slide are really important for your CISSP exam. Not, not to uh, degrade or take any of the light of previous slides, but previous slides are more relying, uh, relying more on your memory. And this one is, um, uh, some of them will rely on your memory, but this one kind of sums up the information that you need to focus on when you uh, take your CISSP exam uh, and face those questions about uh, cryptography and encryption. So um, when we use asymmetric crypto system, basically <clears throat> what we say is that, <coughs> excuse me, um, basically what we say is that for the, both the sender and the receiver, we have both private and public keys, okay? Each one of them hold two parts of their key. One, one part is private, one part is public. Um, in, in the industry today, we are commonly uh, looking at it uh, as, as two different keys, uh, which is not basically true, but let's, let's move on from, from let's, let's move away from that uh, argument, which is uh, completely valid argument, but not for the CISSP. For the CISSP sake, um, basically we, we look at it as two different keys for each party, for each side, the A and B, um, sender and receiver. The sender has its own private key and his uh, its own public key. The receiver has its own private key and its own public key. Each one of them has has two keys. Um, so for them to communicate, the reason that they have these keys, and this is really important uh, to understand when you read through the questions of the CISSP, um, most likely the, the IC will not ask you, um, you know, the, those uh, very relatively easy questions of, um, you know, what, uh, what is the name of the key uh, that the recipient holds and do not share with others. Um, obviously, this is this is not sharing the the not sharing the key. The key means that they use their private key. It's the private key. You will not get those kind of questions. And if you will, I would start worrying about my my exam um, because the again the easier it gets. And uh, going back to session number one, the easier it gets, the farther away you go from, from your CISSP uh, certification. The easier it gets, um, the, the, the harder it is for you to pass the exam. So 
hopefully none of you will go uh, will get this kind of questions about private and public keys, but um, <clears throat> just to understand that uh, there are different uses for the private and the public uh, key. Let me go back to our um, message. OK, uh, looking for text messages and nothing here. OK, you guys are online. Um, and sorry about that, uh, but let's look at the um, again, the uh, relationship between the private and public keys of both sender and receiver. So the reason these two uh, individuals, the sender and receiver, have their keys is because they want to share information, okay? If they don't share information, there's no reason for them to have the keys, right? They can encrypt, simply encrypt the information and hold it. But since they want to share it with others, now they need to exchange keys. And this is good for both symmetric and asymmetric, but with asymmetric, we have uh, even stronger mechanism or stronger process of sharing the keys. Okay, we don't just share one key between the two. We need to share and verify and validate the identity and the, the, the uh, key and the key issuer on the other side. So let's look at the process here. The uh, the assumption is that private key is being kept as a secret with the owner. Okay, um, and and IEC will do everything in their power to. Uh, get you guys to read through the question and be sure that you read that private key needs to be shared. Okay, it will make sense to you, but this is not the case. Private means private. Okay, we do not share the private keys. We always keep them with us. The receiver is always keep the, their private uh, key with them. Even when we want to verify their identity, I am the only one to use my private key and that individual is the only one to use their private key. I cannot get their private key to verify their identity. OK, and they cannot do anything with my key. They cannot use my key, my private key in, in, in any way, in, in for any reason. OK, so look for those questions because I see again is doing everything for you guys to not pass this. OK, this is the way this is the system. We cannot we cannot uh, uh, fight the system. We can win the system. OK, so this is this is our opponent. We need to remember that. Uh, their goal is to win and our goal is to win. And there's only one winner at the end of this. So the process, there are two processes here, as you can see uh, on the presentation. The first process is to share the information. The second process is to validate that the information came from where we think it came. So the first process is uh, uh, initiated by the sender. And the second process is initiated by the receiver. OK, and these are the differences between the two. OK, that's why I put them in these clusters here. One and then two. So the first cluster, let's first cluster. The sender wishes to share information with the recipient. The sender encrypts a message. OK, they take the plain text and they encrypt the message and then use the recipient public key to share that information, okay, to send that information to them. Now, what happens along the way if that information falls into the wrong hands? Since there is an addition of the public key, the public key is kind of the identifier on the message, on the encrypted message, saying who's the one to actually open or decrypt that message. OK, um, let me mute uh, everyone here. I hope you're OK with that. Um, hang on a second. Mute. Victor, thank you for joining us. Um, OK, so again, the uh, sender encrypts the message and puts a little flag there uh, in, the, in, the, in the form of the recipient's public key saying, only the person 
that is holding the private key that combines with this public key can open, can decrypt the message. And then on the recipient side of this receiver side, the receiver gets the message, the encrypted message. The receiver has their own private key and this key fits into the public key. OK, when combined with the public key, decrypts the message and now information is being shared. OK, so objective is achieved here of sharing the information. Now, <clears throat> this part is completed. Uh, the receiver got their information and it was encrypted all the way. No one stole it. It was not disclosed to anyone. Awesome. OK, we got that part right. However, a lot of information um, it comes to receivers and they, they're not sure if this information is uh, actually is, is valid. It came from the right source or they want to validate. If we want to verify that this information came from the right source because they need this validation to get to the non repudiation objective. OK, non repudiation means that no a uh, sender can deny the fact that they actually sent this information and think of it this way. It's really important when you deal with confidential information. Uh, you cannot claim, one cannot claim, hey, I didn't share this information with you because the validation process of uh, using this digital signature, the validation process actually shows that yeah, yes, the sender, you actually sent this information to me and there's uh, uh, there's a whole process behind it to validate that this information came from you and not from anyone else. So you cannot repudiate, OK? You cannot deny the fact that you actually sent it. So it's good when we use uh, confidential information, but it's critical when we use money, money transfer and uh, the financial industry pushes this side of the cyber industry forward, uh, keeps pushing, pushing up forward. Uh, the whole encryption uh, uh, industry is being pushed forward because of financial needs. More and more money is being transferred from one end of the world to another. It's called RTP, real time payment. People want to see their payment in real time. They don't want to wait one business day, two business day, 14 business days. They want to see it now. And for, for us to be able to support that, we need to verify that the sender actually sent the, the, this uh, amount of money. And when we look at the amount of money that is being transferred this week, uh, especially with the, the crisis of the corona, a lot of money is being transferred from everywhere in the world to everywhere in the world. So you have to verify that the sender actually sent you the money. And if you have the proof that the sender actually sent the money, that sender cannot deny now that they wanted you to have the money. OK, so it's really important for today's world. The validation of the identity, the validation of the verification of the identity of the sender. So let's look at that one again. The first cluster is initiated by the sender. The second cluster is initiated by the receiver. Now, after the receiver got the information and they're all good with that, now they want to make sure that the sender actually sign, send their <coughs> send their, uh, um, uh, the information. So in order for us to validate, the sender first need to sign the message using their own private key. And that's what they do with uh, asymmetric crypt cryptocurrency or uh, private uh, key, uh, uh, public key uh, infrastructure. So the sender um, validate the signature using that senders, uh, sorry, the recipient uh, validates the signature using the sender's public key. And the, the, the way for them to access the public key is the same way the sender access the recipient public key. It's public, it's published out there. It can be in a shared directory, it can be shared by the uh, recipient uh, them, uh, themselves, the recipient or the sender, but the fact that it's a public key means that everyone can access that key. So you use that public information of the sender and you validate it against the message, the encrypted message that you got. Uh, you don't do that against their private key. Okay, this is an area where ISC won't uh, know that you can fail. Okay, 
the encryption itself is done using the private key of the sender. Nothing more than nothing less. OK, the public key of the sender is now used to verify the signature that was created on the message. OK, given the fact that they created a signature, we validate the signature using their public key, not their private key. OK, uh, it's really important to remember that I cannot extend this enough. Uh, 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 bear in mind that that this and this is an area that uh, a lot of people will probably get these things confused. So I would like you to also memorize the way this process is being done. Uh, again, the initiator of the first cluster is the sender. The initiator of the second cluster is the recipient, the receiver of the information. This one, um, not this one, but the next one, <laughs> sorry about that, but this one, this slide um, talks about the public key crypto systems, some of them, the RSA, and we'll see uh, the DSA later on, Elgamal, Diffie-Elman Diffie are all combined together. They're kind of related to one, each other, to one another, and then the elliptic curve, the ECC um, algorithm um, are all the crypto systems of uh, uh, public key using uh, public key, using asymmetric crypto systems. Okay, these are all asymmetric crypto systems. But there's a lot of material to remember to memorize uh, for the CISSP, uh, and ISC know that they they, they know that uh, there's a lot of information for you guys to remember. That's why I created this slide here, and some of you that spend the time in my uh, bootcamp, my CSSP bootcamp, know that I say that this one for domain three, for the security engineering, is the most important slide, uh, and, and it's what we call the whiteboard, okay? When you go into the exam, you have a whiteboard uh, that you can write whatever you want on it. This is one thing that I would like you to take with you. The ISC and the uh, exam center cannot take away what you have between your ears, okay, what you memorize. So take it with you, uh, memorize it, put it in somewhere in your storage box up there uh, and bring it with you to, to, to the exam. And as you see uh, in front of the exam, before you start answering anything, just put this thing on your whiteboard Memorize this. It's not too hard, but have it in your memory and put it on your whiteboard and go back to this when you run into questions for the uh, symmetric and asymmetric uh, crypto systems. You will get a lot of questions and I can assure you that no CISSP exam uh, can be passed without going through questions uh, hidden in this one slide. There's a lot of questions you can ask about uh, information here on this slide. For example, uh, the algorithms, and this is this is a cool one because uh, again, some of you that spend the time with me in my CSSP bootcamps remember the uh, pattern or the, the trick here for how to remember the algorithms. Uh, ISC, for example, will throw a question at you and say, um, uh, which which of the following uh, is not considered an asymmetric crypto system. They will say um, AES, 3DES, uh, PGP, and DSA. And you need to remember that DSA is asymmetric. Um, so the, the, the other three are not considered asymmetric or vice versa. OK, um, they will ask you which one is asymmetric, so you need to choose one. But again, they, they play with you. They play with your with your brain. They play with your your eyes and the way you can concentrate or not. Uh, so the way to remember this, I put together this uh, table and I collected this information from all over. Uh, also good people that shared information on online and on Facebook groups. There are a lot of good Facebook group, uh, groups out there. Look, Ahmed has a great group. Uh, I think over 38,000 members in that group. Uh, simply preparing uh, toward the CISSP exam. I highly recommend that group on Facebook. I'm on that group as well. Uh, and also another group of a, uh, a, a friend of mine uh, called Wenz Wu uh, from Taiwan. A much smaller group, but a lot of great insights there. Uh, and I can attest that from being part of the group, a lot of people that are part of this group uh, pass on the first trial of the CSSP. And this is good because you want to take 
this exam as a group. So going back to this slide, and again, to remember, to memorize it, uh, there, there are some method, methods uh, of how to memorize it. So for example, we talk about algorithms. How do you remember all the lists of algorithms that there are in the books? Well, you can't. So what I want to ask you is to just memorize the six asymmetric algorithms. OK, and it goes this way. RSA and DSA, they sound, they sound almost the same. And then from D, the, the letter D, we go to the letter E, ECC and Elgamal. OK, and the last two, Diffie-Hellman and Knapsack. And Knapsack, I do this, OK, uh, for you. And just, just by doing it, and if you do it now, you'll just remember that this is Knapsack, OK? Um, and it will probably help you uh, just memorize this six and know that everything else in your CISSP is symmetric, okay? So this is the difference between the two, okay? This is one uh, area of questions. Another area of questions is the number of keys used in each one of the uh, methods. The symmetric uh, uh, crypto system uses number of keys, and we said we use one key between two parties. So let's say we have four parties, okay? So we imagine uh, 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 the, the uh, square. Um, <clears throat> you have four edges on this square, and when you, when you draw a line between each pair, okay, you draw a line between the first and the second and the third, and then you have the crossword, okay? You have the crossword between A and D, and then B and C, okay? So you basically have six of them, and how do you know that? So you have four parties, okay? You have A, B, C, and D, and then the four times three, okay? N times N minus one. So that's four times three, that's 12, and then divided by two. OK, so you have six keys. That's the way to remember the number of keys. Now, for the asymmetric crypto system, for the asymmetric side and the number of keys, relatively easy. Every, um, uh, the, the amount of participants you have, for example, you have 100 people that are trying to communicate with each other using uh, RSA. How many keys do you have? Simple, have 100 people times two, okay? Each one of them have two uh, keys and you have an overall of 200 uh, keys. Also, um, for the uh, um, the terms or terminology, ter ter terminology that IC uses in the, uh, uh, in the exam, they will use for the asymmetric uh, description, they will use PKI, they will mention SSL, TLS, they will mention this, but look at this carefully, okay? I'm talking about the first line here. Um, ISC will also use the term private key crypto system. And they use private key crypto system for, uh, they try to trigger in your head that, oh, private key, it sounds like public key, and public key, uh, is always asymmetric. Well, guess what? It's not, okay? Private key crypto system, uh, when I use that, they refer to symmetric crypto system. They use also terms like secret key or shared key or session key to describe a symmetric crypto system. But the, the one that keeps uh, 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 people keeps failing on is the private key crypto system. Um, okay, the, the, obviously it's easy to manipulate your brain this way. Um, also, you need to remember the word pain, P-A-I-N, and I'm referring to the fifth row here, uh, P-A-I-N. Uh, these are the objectives. Uh, when we started this uh, chapter, we looked at the confidentiality, integrity, uh, non-repudiation, and authentication. These are the four that we see here and now, even though it doesn't look much like confidentiality here, but let me let me uh, uh, talk about this a bit more. The privacy 
um, that we refer to here. Privacy is also considered confidentiality of information because the way we hide the information, we keep it private. So we call it privacy, okay? It will help you remember that uh, when, when you take the exam. It will help you memorize the word pain and understand what objective can be fulfilled or can be achieved using different uh, crypto system. So for when you use symmetric crypto system, you cannot achieve authenticity or integrity or non-repudiation. You do not use hash using symmetric crypto system, okay? You can only achieve privacy. You can only protect the data. You can only hide the data. Uh, and, and this part for the symmetric crypto system is really important because while you use AES, which AES 256, which is considered a, a very strong encryption uh, um, algorithm, you only achieve the confidentiality of information. Okay, um, if you want to use, if you want to get the non repudiation, you need to add something, you need to add the RSA, you need to use different crypto system or additional crypto system for asymmetric. So going back to the side of asymmetric, the asymmetric provides you both privacy slash confidentiality, but also authenticity of information, integrity, because you can use the hash function as we mentioned, and then you can get the non-repudiation because of the exchange of keys. And let, let's go back two slides back just to see the process of non-repudiation again. Uh, again, the uh, receiver verifies and validates this, the uh, sender's identity or the sender's uh, 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 actually sending the information using their signature. And with the, the next session, we will speak about uh, um, digital signatures and the, the overall relationship between the digital signature and the external party that validates the identity of the sender. But for that matter, for your CISSP, again, take the word pain, privacy, authenticity, integrity, non-repudiation. The pain can only be achieved with asymmetric crypto system. Now for the costs. We say that we get all the benefits from these uh, crypto systems, but what are the costs? The costs for each one of the uh, uh, methods is relatively simple to understand. Asymmetric, because it uses far more keys uh, and, and far more keys than symmetric, and provides more protection, it provides the full pain, okay, for that matter, it's very slow. Okay, and that's the cost of using asymmetric crypto system. Um, the symmetric uh, side, relatively fast. Uh, however, the fact that we use the single key or the private key or the secret key um, means that uh, uh, when, when this key is jeopardized, the, the, when this key is now uh, leaked or or uh, compromised by by someone or something or some system, then the whole process, the whole system of protecting the information is now jeopardized and failed. Okay, so uh, the, this is the cost of using symmetric uh, crypto system. Symmetric single key failure and asymmetric very slow. And we see these two, these relations between two different uh, uh, methods for uh, uh, infecting our systems, for example, with ransomware. There are ransomware, uh, the, the malicious code that relies on symmetric uh, crypto system, and there are ransomware that relies on asymmetric crypto system. It depends on what is the, the quote unquote risk tolerance of the attacker. They, they, if they have time, if they think they have time, they will probably use asymmetric crypto system, which is harder to break. If they don't think they have time and they want to be more opportunities, they will use symmetric crypto system. However, the FBI and the US government, thank God, they, they're spending a lot of money in uh, uh, breaking those symmetric uh, crypto systems and they actually publish keys to overcome ransomware attacks on a, on a website called normalransomware.com. 
So um, with this note, we will conclude today's session. And thank you everyone for joining. I'll just check the text messages to see if we have any um, any questions. Uh, Roy, you asked a question on those, only those that their public key is used, meaning everyone whom their public key was used when I encrypted can open. Um, if I understand the question correctly, um, so with what you refer to is when I encrypted the message using my private key and then added the public key of the recipient one or recipients, uh, uh, multiple recipients, uh, you're asking if those um, come again. Uh, I see another question. It's more like saying that I can encrypt for a bunch of people, not just one. Yes, it is. Um, and Roy, if you want to join the conversation, just raise your hand. I'll join you in. Uh, but yes, that means that you can have more than one recipient, but you need to make sure that you use all their public keys. Okay, does that make sense, Roy? All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Roy. <laughs> uh, so thank you, everybody. And um, see you again next week, next Monday, same time, same place. Um, and this one will go, this one is recorded now, thank God. Uh, it will go online um, tonight, I hope. And then again, for the previous session, I will have that one recorded again. Unfortunately, that one was not recorded properly, and I will need to record it again. Uh, it will happen the next day or two, and then I'll upload it uh, to YouTube as well and send you guys the, uh, the link for that. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, see you all next week. Bye-bye.